So um, thank you and good morning. And I am the reason that the mic is this height. <laughs> so thank you to all the previous speakers for accommodating me. And I also just want to say, can we have one more round of applause to say happy pride? <laughs> so not only the first day of summer, but we're kicking off Pride Weekend here in the Twin Cities. So I just want to say welcome and uh, thank you all for inviting me here to, to speak today. So the topic is craft, 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 craft. What is craft? It feels like something that should be very straightforward. But what I'm beginning to learn is that craft is actually a very complex idea and not so straightforward. So if I were to actually poll the room right now and say to you, what is craft? My guess is that each and every one of you is probably going to give me a different definition and a different description. And so what I'd like to do is have everyone just take a minute, take 15 seconds, pause, and if you want, even jot down, but just grab for yourself what you think your definition of craft is. So thinking about craft, what it is, who makes it, where it's made, who buys it, why, it's mad, why it matters, how to support it, how to encourage it, is actually my new job, my new day job as the executive director of the American Craft Council. And it's not just my day job, it's my night job and it's my sleep job. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, I actually don't come from the craft world. I come from the world of contemporary art. And I actually don't consider myself a maker of any kind. In fact, my career, and which has had a variety of twists and turns to it, has actually been largely dedicated to public art practice. So what I want to share with you this morning are not my thoughts as an expert of craft, because I don't consider myself an expert of craft, but rather the how and why of how craft brought me back to the Twin Cities and here in front of you today and brought me back in the snowiest April on record. <laughs> and some things that I've encountered and discovered about it in the last, in the short three months I've been on the job. So let's go back to my pre-craft days, Tom. So for 22 years, I worked at the Walker Arts Center um, in a variety of different jobs. Uh, mostly as the director of education and a curator of public practice. And that was a total soup to nuts job. I did everything from lectures and symposia and kids programs, everything that you associate with museum education. But along with that, over time, myself and my team really started thinking about how to ha create more inventive ways and inventive opportunities for artists to come into the museum in the contemporary art world, as well as how to engage audiences in new and fun ways. So some of the things um, that you may remember or may not know that have happened at the Walker in that time were we launched Artist Design Mini Golf. Tom, raise your hand, OK? <laughs> there are a lot of familiar faces in the audience. Um, we did a big project called Open Field, which was actually trying to reimagine the museum as a cultural commons. And this was a project we did for four years. Has anyone in the audience actually, did anyone in the audience ever come to Open Field? A couple. Um, so what we did is we actually took an, an, an empty, it was that before the, before the walker had redone its space, it was an empty field. And we thought about what it would mean to create a social space. So this is, we took this. We dug it up, and then we created a space where people could come, where artists and the public could come and host their own activities, much like you see sort of at the commons here or in spaces that are cropping up around here. 
The central theme to Open Field was power to the people. <laughs> and the idea was just to create a radical space where people could come and show up as they are and share their creative interests with each other. We did over 300 activities in four years. I am not going to run through that whole laundry list, but some of the things we did include bull whipping lessons from a professional bull whipper, who, um, plein air painting. Of course, there was a prerequisite knitting lessons. Car break-in workshops for kids. <laughs> And I will say, what, go back, go back, go back. So, and I will say with this one, um, <laughs> we actually did this one when it was 100 degrees outside in the summer. So it was a little concerned that, th this, this was a two-part workshop where we, we taught kids how to break into cars and then we also taught them how to get out of a locked trunk in case <laughs> anyone had ever put them in a trunk. Um, and then apparently some of them went home and broke their parents' cars. <laughs> and then we also did things like, in the, in the, towards the end, we did this great project where we wrote love letters and sent them to random strangers in the phone book. And, <laughs> applause, some more applause. And then, of course, one of the things that came out of Open Field was the Internet Cat Video Festival. And I'm, I'm proud to say that myself and Katie Hill, I know you're here, you have to raise your hand. Right there, Katie Hill is actually the creator of the Internet Cat Video Festival, and she's in our midst. And the rough story was we, Katie and I thought when, when, we, when this project sort of evolved, we thought 150 people would come and 10,000 people came and stopped <laughs> traffic. And the, you know, this is one of these things where we actually misjudged the audience for the event. And these were the audiences that I began to introduce to the Walker Art Center. So you, beca you can begin to see why in 2014 I needed to leave. <laughs> And, my so and I moved with my husband to New York to begin a freelance career as a public engagement consultant. And I spent some time actually working for the High Line, the elevated park um, in New York. And after a while, I became known in my colleague circles is, as that lawn girl. <laughs> so one day, I was, in my, I was at home, and I got a call on the phone from a recruiter, and they said, would you be interested in a job as the executive director of the American Craft Council? Now, I had worked with the American Craft Council before when I, when I was here, and I, I, knew, I knew something about them. But the American Craft Council is actually this really fascinating organization. It was founded in 1943 by an artist and philanthropist, Eileen Osborne Webb, who saw a need to promote handmade craft and provide markets and opportunities for artists and artisans. In a time when technology, and in this case it was the rise of industrial design, and urbanization were rapidly changing the world. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. And I was very intrigued <clears throat> by this history and actually really by, the, by thinking about what is the role of making, what is the role of craft, what is the role of the handmade in, in, in this you know, digital, virtual, fast-paced, rapidly changing, upside-down world that we live in. Now, as I told you before, I don't come from craft, and I'm not a maker. So I had to pause for a moment and ask myself, what am I going to bring to the table here? How am I going to convince these people that actually because this is a this is a this is a long-standing organization. It supports craft at so many different levels. Fine craft. It's got long, long, long tendrils and histories. Does amazing work, and I really had to I had to show up and 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 sort of position myself. So, as I said, I'm not a maker, and in fact, the last time I successfully completed a project was in this photo. <laughs> When I decoupaged a wine bottle, 
<laughs> and had longer hair. <laughs> and actually, as I started thinking about it, and I'm thinking about it now, that's actually not true. That's not the last project I made. If I could have brought a prop, it would have been the bag of failed knitting projects <laughs> that I've done over the years and the infinite number of tube scarves that are about this long <laughs> that choke me when I try to wrap them around my neck. So I actually had to pause and I had to start thinking about what my relationship to craft really was. And as I started thinking about it, I realized, you know, those knitting projects are not just failed knitting projects. You know, that one was the one where uh, friend Christy actually sat with me for hours trying to teach me how to cast on. The other knitting project, well, that was one that I had saved that from my grandmother when she tried to teach me how to knit. And actually I had stuffed it in a big basket of hers of yarn that I took from her after she passed away. And then there was another project I realized I had started and not finished from a class that I had taken when I was really, really, really sad and I wanted to find something to do to fill my time and to meet other people. And then I started looking around my house and I realized, well, wait, there's that vase that I have that I bought from Warren McKenzie's studio when I first moved here as a graduate student in 1989. And it's, it's, and it's not just that one. Suddenly I remembered, well, there's two other pieces that I bought my parents. Wait. Now there's that glass face I have. You know, my friend David gave that to me. He's a glass blower, and I've actually gone with him to the glass blowing studio. And this goes on and on. And what I start to realize is that I, in fact, have many relationships to craft, even though I am not a maker. And in fact, craft is all around me. And it always has been all around me. And so, what I realized is everyone has a craft story. And with this, I went forward and I started pursuing this position and I found myself here. And with this idea that everyone has a craft story, what I've been doing is actually going around and asking people to tell me their craft stories, to share with me how does craft fit into their life? Do they think that it fits into their life? Are they makers? And I've been traveling around, talking to all kinds of people, most intensively at these craft shows that the American Craft Council hosts in a variety of different cities, in Baltimore, in San Francisco, in Atlanta, and here in St. Paul. And I've been talking with artists, and some of the stories, I've been talking with artists at early stages of their career. I've been talking with artists who have been in the field for 50 years. I've been talking with artists who weave, who make glass, who make ceramics, who do jewelry, who make things that there isn't even a category for. Who have individual studios, or maybe, like this great design team that I love that makes handmade carbon steel cookware that is just simply luxurious and to die for. So this, this actually, I was gonna say craft is a big tent, and then I was gonna go to actually it's a big rug. Um, and it actually is a big woven rug. This is a project that I did at the Walker Art Center with the artist Fritz Haig um, for a project called At Home in the City. And we, um, in the lobby, in one of the public spaces of the Walker, we wove this big rug that then moved into a gallery space that was actually used as um, a gathering space and a platform for people to come and gather and make, do performances and make things together. So I, I like to think this is our craft community. So what I've been learning in this process is and through these stories, because these stories all have rich and diverse threads to them. And I've been trying to think about what connects all of this together, right? What connects the professional artist to the person who just has a lovely vase in their home that they adore? And as I've been thinking about it and as I've been understanding it, it sort of dawned on me why I was so drawn to craft. 
And this is really because it is much more than a way to make an object. It is much more than a way to brand a product. It is even much more than a process. I realize that I am here, and this will probably be self-evident to all of you, but it actually wasn't that self-evident to me because I was trying to think about the beginning to the end to how I got here, is that in fact, craft actually is a community. And it's a community to which we all can belong by virtue of our making, by virtue of our appreciating, and by virtue of sharing these values of slowing down, of paying attention, of committing yourself deeply to learning something, of a focused engagement with the material world, and of holding those things dear, those dear beloved objects that hold memories and hold, hold the threads of our body in them. So whether you have a collection, whether you're a maker, however you've arrived here today as craft, you know, as thinking about craft, I believe that craft reminds us that everybody has something to learn and everybody has something to teach. And every one of us has a craft story. So I hope we can all discover what they are and share them. So thank you.